You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. Romans chapter 8. If you would, stand with me as we honor the reading of, of Scripture together. Read the first four verses this morning. There is... Therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit is, of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And we'll stop there. Romans 8, is, it's hard to stop um, reading, but we will. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that You would that you would guide us. Lord, we pray that your Spirit would work in a, a tremendous way in our midst this morning. Lord, we pray that our eyes might be opened, that we might see this, this text in a, in a fresh way, that it would impact our, our hearts that we would be receptive to it in ways that we could not imagine. Lord, we pray that we would see past the inadequacy of, inadequacy of, of speech, of, of technique, of delivery. Lord, that we would even look past some of the, the places where there might be error and that you would open our ears to see and hear the truth ring. Lord, we pray that you do that this morning. We pray that you speak to us through your word, that you, re you receive honor and glory, that you accomplish something great today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to approach Romans chapter 8 a little bit different than we did chapter 7. We certainly could go back and visit chapter 7 again and glean a lot from it. We're not moving past it because there isn't a lot there. There is. But what we wanted to do there was, was get the big picture, set the stage for chapter 8. Now, when we enter chapter 8, there, we are immediately reminded that what is said in chapter 8 hinges on what was said in chapter 7. In the first verse there, we see the word therefore that draws our attention back to chapter 7 and, and really uh, Paul's argument in the, the letter, the epistle so far. So... We're not going to necessarily leave chapter 7, but we're going to build on it. Chapter 8 has been called by uh, many the greatest chapter in all of the Bible. One pastor was preaching through it and said that it was the greatest chapter in the Bible. And after the service, one of his parishioners later uh, reminded him that he also called the third chapter in Hosea the greatest chapter in the Bible. There's something to be said of what Martin Lloyd-Jones said. He said, uh, for the preacher, the greatest chapter in the Bible is the one he is currently preaching through. I would tend to agree with that, but yet there's something special about Romans 8 that sets it on another level in one respect. Uh, Charles G. Trumbull, uh, who was the, the editor of Sunday School Times, um, made this point, I, I think. He said, the eighth chapter of Romans has become particularly precious to me. Beginning with no condemnation, ending with no separation, 
and in between, no defeat. This wondrous chapter sets forth the gospel in the plan of salvation, the life of freedom and victory, the hopelessness of the natural man and the righteousness of the born again, the indwelling of Christ in the Holy Spirit, the resurrection of the body, the blessed hope of Christ's return, the working together of all things for our good, every tense of the Christian life, past, present, and future, in the glorious, climatic song of triumph, no separation in time of in, in time or eternity from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. End quote. Another commentator said that if the Bible was a ring, the book of Romans would be the, the precious jewel and the eighth chapter of Romans the sparkling point on that jewel. I could go on and on with quotes about Roman eight, Romans 8. Here's one more. John Piper said uh, this when asked uh, why Romans 8 was the, the greatest chapter. He said, Romans chapter 8 is so dense and so constant with good news. Good news that is so great, so glorious, and so vastly superior to all good news in the world. Whether health good news, or family good news, or church good news, or job good news, or political good news, or international good news, or financial good news, so vastly superior to all earthly good news, and so relentless that you can scarcely feel the force of it until you take virtually every verse and restate it as the good news that it is. End quote. The entire chapter according to John Piper, is about good news. He's right. Just look at the first verse. I would suggest, um, along with a lot of others, that verse 1 is the theme of the entire chapter. Perhaps it's the theme of the entire Bible, which makes Romans 8 even that much more important. Let's just take a few moments and look at the, the chapter as a whole to kind of get the the, the outline of it, even though that quote before really stated it. The chapter is about good news. In, in verse 1, really the theme of the whole chapter, but it's still good if we briefly look at how the chapter flows. And, and really, we can divide it into six sections. I'm not the first to suggest these sections. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Charles Hodge, James Boyce uh, have all have divisions that are very close to this. The, the first division would be no condemnation from the law. Um, the next section would speak of our deliverance from our sinful nature. The third talks about being a son and daughter of God. Fourth, we see the, the hope of future glory. Fifth, another reason the believer can know their salvation is secure and that there is no condemnation is because of the intercession of the Holy Spirit, which is, is taught here plainly and clearly. Then sixth, in verses 28 through 39, we see the greatest of all, that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And this is what uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones called an argument involving the very character of God. So here we see both the purpose and the character of God clearly. So with that, let's go back to the first verses uh, more specifically, uh, let's look at verse 1. Primarily, that's where we're going to uh, be today, just in the first verse, kind of an introduction to the chapter as a whole. We need to spend uh, time here because, as James Boyce says, this verse is not only the theme of Romans 8, but everything flows from this verse. The rest of the chapter is basically an exposition of this one idea. So we need to get this idea. One of the things that we need to do here at the onset is, is look at three important words in the first verse. Not that the rest of them are not important. I just want to highlight three uh, as we move on from here and start building on this and uh, looking at this, at this first verse. Um, first, look at the word condemnation. Condemnation. We need to start our discussion on this word condemnation by saying clearly that this word is very difficult to understand in that few of us have any experience with it. 
Leon Morris defines this word by saying, condemnation is a forensic term which here includes both the sentence and the execution of the sentence. The word forensic just means legal or court speak. So it's a, a term that is using court of law that includes the judge's sentence. You've been found guilty of these crimes and I sentence you to death in the electric chair. That's the sentence. And then ultimately, after the appeals process is exhausted and the sentence is carried out, the person actually dies in the electric chair. That's part of condemnation as well. It's that whole thing. The judge could say that the sentence is life in prison with no possibility of parole. Then the condemnation includes both the shock of the sentence pronouncement and also the life spent in prison that ends in death. That's all condemnation. Condemnation is not just the end. Think about this a little bit differently. Instead of a courtroom... Think of a doctor's office. The doctor says, you have cancer or some other sickness, and then follows that by saying that it's, it's terminal, meaning that it's going to end in death. As the sickness takes its toll, there will be an end. There's a whole process. And in this moment, condemnation includes both the doctor's prognosis, this is terminal, and also the effects of the sickness on your body, the decline and ultimately the death of your body. So you see that what I mean when I say that this is difficult for us to grasp because most of us have not even been on the front side of this. Most of us cannot comprehend standing before a judge and having him deliver a death sentence, let alone bearing the weight of it. But here is the deal. This is what Paul has already taught us in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20. And he has taught us that whether we understand our situation or not, we have already received the sentence and are waiting for it to be carried out. You get that? This is the place that humanity is in. There is no one that is righteous. No, not one. There is no one who seeks after God. They have altogether become worthless. There is no fear for God before their eyes. John chapter 3 is very clear. You stand condemned already. So whether we understand our situation or not, we have already received the sentence and are waiting for it to be carried out. This is why the gospel is so precious. Because it, it's only in the gospel do people even understand their situation. People don't get their situation if it wasn't for the gospel. Unless one sees the gospel for what it is, one will not see condemnation for what it is. And once one sees condemnation for what it is, they also see that Jesus is their only hope. That's the, the preciousness of the gospel. And I think it's here where there's a, a common misconception about what condemnation is. I think people think that, that what condemnation is is something that only happens in the future. Act now, because condemnation is coming. No, condemnation is here. At the end of your life, either you're condemned or you're not. No. The sentence has already been given. This is where the second word comes in. Notice the word now in verse 1. Now. There is therefore now 
no condemnation. The word now is a time word. It indicates present as opposed to the past. Before there was, in this case, condemnation. Now there is no condemnation. This change comes about as a result of the the Christian being justified before God, which was made possible by the death of Jesus. Justification is a a forensic term as well. It's it's a declaration of a judge saying that that accounts have been settled. The person is, is not guilty. There's no sentence to be carried out on the grounds that somebody else paid the price and bore the, the weight, the consequences on your behalf. Somebody else died in the electric chair, therefore you get off. This is where we go back to Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. And there we recognize that death here is not only physical death, but it's the wrath of God. I don't think we think about that like that. I don't think we think about death in Romans 6.23 as wrath. And I don't think we think about it as condemnation. But just look how the Bible talks about this. Romans 1.18 says that the wrath of God is being revealed against ungodliness. Romans 2.5, we see that the unrepentant heart is storing up wrath and that there will be a day when God's wrath against ungodliness will be revealed. In verse 8, we see that there will be wrath and fury for those who are not in Christ. In chapter 3, in verse 5, we see a rhetorical question by Paul. And the meaning here is absolutely clear. God is righteous in inflicting wrath on the unrighteous. In Romans 5, 9, we see that Jesus is the only one who can save us from the wrath of God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we learn that, that humanity is by nature under the wrath of God. Ephesians 5, 6, Paul declares that the Christian should live differently. We should put away things for which the wrath of God will fall on those who do not believe. Colossians 3, 6, the wrath of God is coming because of sin. In 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we see that Jesus delivers us from the wrath of God. Clearly, then, there are those who are waiting for the wrath of God. There are those who stand condemned. In Revelation 6, we see that when that day comes, and the wrath of the Lamb comes, there will not be anyone who will stand I want you to see that we're not just making a a mountain out of a molehill here. Making a big deal out of a little word now in Romans. And then in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. This speaks of of condemnation. I want you to, to see that this includes the sentence that has already been delivered. The wages of sin is death. That is wrath. As sinners, one should see the, the weight of this. That because of sin, God in His justness and holiness has declared that His holy and righteous wrath will be poured out on them. There's a weightiness here. Like there's a a weight when a judge communicates the sentence to the defendant. Sometimes when you watch somebody who is either Protest, you know, persisting on their, their innocence. They think they're going to get off, but they don't in a court of law. That moment that the judge tells them to, to stand up, I'm going to deliver the sentence. And then he says, they're guilty. And they just collapse. I used to watch court TV quite a bit. Then they changed it to true TV or something, I think, but usually there were, there were big cases on there. Uh, the defendant would usually, you know, you know in those cases, the, the defendant would uh, often say that they were innocent, and it was this controversial thing, and the verdict would, was come, and the, the sentence was read, and they would just almost just fall back into their chair. 
it is as if all of the weight of the situation was, was too much for them. The fact is, this person should have understood the consequences for the crimes that were committed by them. They should have known. If, if you kill someone, and there's a good possibility that you're going to turn around and pay for that with your life. The consequences for, for crimes isn't a, a hidden thing. In Romans 7, the more we learn what God demands of us, the more we see areas in which we fall short. Here we see that. For the, the Christian, there is now no condemnation. For the Christian, you don't, you don't stand condemned. You don't wait for the, the verdict to be carried out. You know your, your situation. The verdict is not guilty based on what Christ has already done on our behalf. There's no wondering. There's, no, there's only assurance. The word here is extremely important. There is now. It's like being in the doctor's office. The doctor tells you that what you have is terminal, terminal and, and there's this shock to your system. But then he says, don't, don't worry. You'll be fine once you take this pill. There's, there's no need to worry. That there's now no condemnation. That there's now going to be no, no effects of this. You, you have it but, it, but it's already been dealt with. The third important word here is the word no. No. One reason that this word is, is so important here is because the intensity, the, the intensity of the word is extremely difficult to translate in our English Bibles. I mean, there's, there's a simple word in, in Greek, like a negation, a no, but there's other ways to emphasize uh, no as, as well. And, and here we, we see those. It's, it's not just the normal word for no. It's, it's a compound word. So it's stronger. And it's at the very uh, beginning of a, of a sentence, which intensifies it even more. So it's really difficult to state in, in, in English the intensity that this has in the original language. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it this way, not only is the Christian not in a state of condemnation now, he never can be. It is impossible. Think about that statement. Not only are they not in a state of condemnation now, he never can be. It's impossible. Think about it. I think that this is another place where the preciousness of the gospel is seen. Just think about this for a moment. The, the, the gospel includes the message that because of our sin, we stand condemned before God. The message of the gospel is clear on this point. We have violated at every turn the righteous standard of God. We are both by nature and by choice sinners. And for that reason, we deserve the wrath of a holy God. The gospel is clear on that. The gospel then is so beautiful because it paints a situation that is without hope. It is without remedy apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ. Any gospel that gives any remedy for our situation either now or in the future apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ is not the gospel of Jesus where there were wages of sin is death. It was Christ who bore the penalty of that on our behalf so that Paul could turn around in the, the next half of Romans 6.23 and declare that the gift of God is eternal life. Isn't that something? There was condemnation, but now there is not. There is no condemnation, nor will there ever be condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me see if we can paint this picture a little bit in closing and, and set up the rest of the chapter. 
There's, there's a man, say, who was convicted of murder and was on death row for his crimes. Uh, he's, he's sitting there waiting for the, the sentence to be carried out. He's going through all the, the process, the appeals, and all of that. It takes a long time. During this time, he gets sick, and he goes to the doctor, and the doctor tells him that he has cancer. It's, it's terminal, that he has no more than a year to live. So in, in one way or the other, the guy's going to the guy's gonna die. Not long after the doctor gives this man the news concerning his health, the prison warden wants to see him. He goes before the warden and says, the warden says to him, I have some great news for you. There's new evidence in your case. Um, you're going to go before the judge tomorrow. He's going to vacate the verdict and you are going to be free. The court will declare you not guilty. Everybody will know you're innocent because somebody else confessed to the crime. Whatever. I think sometimes this is how we think of condemnation. We think of it as solving the one problem, but we forget the other problem needs to be dealt with. We, we think of condemnation just in terms of this legal problem, this forensic problem, when we forget about the sin problem that makes us sick. When this verse says there is no condemnation, it is saying that not only has God declared us to be not guilty, but also that God is in the process of freeing us from the sickness of sin. And it's in these verses in chapter 8 that we see the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives freeing us from our, our flesh, our, our sinfulness, growing us and, and sanctifying us. Look at verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. If you are Christ then the Spirit of God dwells in you and He is working to free you from the sickness of sin. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because He took the penalty on your behalf. He dealt with that. And He is working in your life to free you from the sickness that sin has caused you. He's growing us in graces. He is changing us. He's sanctifying us. Another way to say sanctifying is He's changing you. He's in that process. Let me just draw your attention to two things before we leave this this morning. First, I want you to notice the Trinity here in the text. I, I think this is crucial. I don't want to miss this. Sometimes we, we divide the, the Trinity. We say that the Father was active in the Old Testament, Christ in the New Testament, the Spirit is at work now. Uh, well, that is true that we notice the ministry of each more clearly at different times. We must not separate them like modalists do. Modalists emphasize the, the oneness of God and deny the Trinity. There are churches in town that teach this. I, I think for us, we don't do this formally. But when it comes to the practical outworking of our faith, a lot of times we look like that. But just notice the Trinity here. In, in the first verse, we see that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In verse 2, we see that we have been set free in Christ Jesus. It was through the death of Christ that we were united with Him and are said to be in Christ. In verse 3, we read that it was the Son who was sent for sin and thus condemned sin. In other words, there is real victory in what Christ accomplished on the cross. We see the Holy Spirit in verse 2 and 4. Verse 2, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free. The Spirit set you free. In verse, in, in verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In verse 3, we see that God the Father did what the law could not do. He sent forth His Son to die for sin. 
to be an offering for sin, which means that the righteous requirement of the law that cannot be met within and of ourselves was met in Christ. And those are joined with Christ through His death. So you see the the Trinity there, even in the the first four verses that we read this morning. Uh, This brings up a second thing here that we need to take note of, and that is, this is all the work of God. This is all the work of God. There is now no condemnation because of what God has done. Just just notice how some of this is worded. In verse 2, it is the Spirit that set you free in Christ Jesus. In verse 3, God did what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. He sent His Son to be an offering for sin. There is no element of here that God and you are working together to accomplish something great. God did it. In verse 3, it was Jesus that fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. Over and over and over again in this chapter, as well as the entire Bible, we see that God is at work accomplishing what we can never accomplish in and of ourselves. This is the essence of the Gospel. God saves us and sanctifies us when we are too weak to do it on our own. We are weak. He is strong. Of course, we'll see more of this later. But just think about this in terms of the first verse. There is no condemnation. There is not now, nor will there ever be, condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If our salvation rested in us in any way, shape, or form, there would be the risk of condemnation. Get that here. Those who suggest that we can somehow lose this salvation that we have in Christ, that we can be in Christ and then out of Christ either by our choice or by our actions or behavior, then we are saying that it's possible to go in and out of condemnation based on us. This first verse and the rest of the chapter puts that kind of thinking to rest. In Romans 8, and we'll see this as we move through the chapter, and even more so in in chapter 9 in the sense, from start to finish, our salvation is the product of God's grace alone. This is the Gospel. That God has done in Christ what we could never do. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. He was perfect, and then He died for us so that His perfect righteousness might be ours. So grasp this. There are two groups of people. Those who are under condemnation and those who are not. Two groups. Those who are in Christ Jesus and those who are not in Christ Jesus. This first verse should make us pause and think about this for a moment. What group of people am I in? I think there are those who who know that they're not in Christ in the sense that of what Paul is speaking about here. Paul's pretty radical. You know, when he's talking about being in Christ, and he goes on and he explains that, that union with Christ, yeah, I'm probably not to that level, but, I, but I'm not on the other side either, so I'm okay. That's the logic. They might intellectually believe what Jesus has done, but it has no bearing on the outworking of their life now at all. Nor do they want it to. They want to live their lives now as they see fit. They want to rule their own life. They want freedom and autonomy. And they think that they're okay. Because, well, I'm not to that level. I'm not to that level, so I'm okay. I think this first verse should prompt some self-reflection, some evaluation. No condemnation is for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the question is, is, what does that mean? Am I in Christ or am I out? Because if you're out, 
If you're not in Christ, then you already stand condemned before God. And, and, and the plea here at the beginning of Romans 8 is don't leave this place today condemned because you don't have to. You, th- no condemnation now. You can have it now. Place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your only hope. Right? Come visit with me about this. Talk to somebody else that you know is in Christ and let them help you and, and guide you. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. There's no better time than there is right now. Now. There's no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let the now be today for you if you don't know Jesus Christ in a personal way. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for um, Your goodness to us. We thank You for uh, the the beauty of the Gospel um, that we don't have to stand condemned any longer. That Jesus took the, the wrath that was due us on Himself for our sake so that His perfect righteousness might become ours. And that we might stand before you as not condemned, but as your child. Lord, and I pray that there are none here today that are outside of this, that are not in Christ Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts, in our lives. We pray that you would move in a special way that we might see the truth and the beauty of the gospel. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.